Hi, my name is Brian Chen. I am a researcher at the National Institute on Aging Intramural Research Program. I'm here with Dr. Steve Horvath, Professor of Biostatistics and Human Genetics at UCLA. I'm the first author, and he's the last author of this paper titled DNA Methylation-Based Measures of Biological Age, a Meta-Analysis Predicting Time to Death. Um, it was published in Aging, and apparently it has the highest altmetric score for impact journals of all time. Yes, my name is Steve, it's Brian mentioned, I um, developed um, an age predictor based on methylation levels in 2013. This biomarker is sometimes referred to as the epigenetic clock. It is based on measuring methylation levels of 353 CPGs and then averaging these um, 353 numbers. And that average allows one to precisely estimate really chronological age of many different tissues, for example, of blood, lung, liver, kidney, skin, really every cell type that contains DNA lends itself for this epigenetic clock analysis. Other people published methods that allow one to estimate the age of blood tissue, and all of these papers came out around 2013. But the biggest question was always whether these age estimates capture biological age. So in other words, imagine you have an age estimate that is, let's say, 40, whereas the person is actually known to be 38 years old. So there's a little error of two years. And the question is whether this error represents pure noise, for example, coming from different ways of extracting the DNA or storing the DNA, or whether this difference captures biologically useful information. So you can imagine Imagine for some people, this difference in age estimate could be positive. They're two years older than expected or five years older than expected. Or it could be negative. Their age estimate in blood, for example, would be minus five years. So they seem to be much younger. And then the question is whether this difference could lend itself, for example, to predict mortality further down the road. And so Brian and I and a uh, slew of 63 other co-authors from 13 different cohort studies were interested in answering this question. And so we combined blood methylation data that com came from blood samples that were typically collected in the 1990s. And so we had 10, 15, 20 years of follow-up information and we knew who of these people ended up dying, what was their age at death, and so on. And so we could then ask the question whether these blood samples from the 1990s lent themselves for predicting age at death and or lifespan of individual people. And as I mentioned, we had 13,000 samples from 13 cohorts. There were 2,700 deaths. And so this was the largest um, study to date to address this question. I should briefly mention there were already three papers published in last year that looked at a, the similar question, but these were much smaller studies. But all three studies that I'm aware of had shown that yes, methylation age predicts um, lifespan. However, even though there were three publications, these results were still being criticized because people thought maybe these are false positives. And so there was really a need for a large scale and very rigorous study to address that question. So we analyzed these samples and I want to mention our data also contained three different ethnic groups, Caucasian samples, Hispanic samples, and samples from African Americans. And the upshot is that no matter how we analyze the data, we always found that these methylation age estimates predict life expectancy, even after we control for the chronologic age and various risk factors. And we found that it predicts life expectancy in all three ethnic groups. And I let Brian mentioned results of what we call a subset analyses, where we looked at, for example, only some people who were smokers, or only men, or only women. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. I think because of the large size of our study, we were able to split our data and examine these subgroups, as Steve was mentioning. So one of these subgroups is different race, ethnic backgrounds. And as Steve said, again, we said we had white, black, and also Hispanic individuals, and we didn't see very strong differences between between the three, even though we had very small sample sizes in the Hispanic group. We also split by male and female. Didn't look like there was many differences in terms of the association between DNA methylation age 
and mortality adjusted for chronological age and other risk factors. We also split by smoking status, body mass index categories. There were always slight differences, but they were not statistically significantly different. We also separated by different disease statuses. So if somebody had a cardiovascular disease or diabetes, we split by that because that they, there could be differential associations there, but we didn't see any evidence of that. So in total, we see pretty robust findings across different cohorts and across subgroups within those cohorts. Yes, so there can no longer be any doubt that the epigenetic age or the methylation age of blood is predictive of life expectancy. However, there's some interesting follow-up questions. For example, which, what about if you, we use DNA samples extracted from other tissues? let's say methylation levels in adipose tissue, meaning fat tissue, or methylation levels sampled from buccal epithelial cells or skin cells. Could it be that these cells contain a signal that is even more predictive of life expectancy than the signal in blood? Also, the other thing we want to mention is, although there is no doubt that these are significant predictors of life expectancy in the sense of statistically very significant predictors, it remains to be seen whether this information has any clinical utility for an individual. So for example, I measured my methylation age in blood and it turned out to be five years older than expected, but I'm not too concerned about it because I'm actually in good shape according to other biomarkers, for example, the cholesterol levels or body mass index and so on. So we just don't know whether this has any clinically relevant information. Yeah, and I guess another way to say that is the uh, contribution of known risk factors for mortality are probably might be much stronger than what we're finding, although ours is statistically significant. I think the importance is that we're suggesting that, not suggesting that this DNA methylation age contributes a large proportion. I guess what we're suggesting is not that DNA methylation age is contributing a lot clinically to mortality, but what we're saying is that there is biological relevance for this DNA methylation age measure. Yes, the study is a very important illustration of the finding that epigenetic changes must relate to a root cause of aging. Because there was a question whether these age-related methylation changes are just marker of aging similar to gray hair and so on, you know. And as you know, you don't cure aging by coloring your hair, you know. <laughs> and similarly, there was a question whether these epigenetic changes have any relevance, you know. However, now we found without a doubt that they must relate to at least one root cause of aging. There could be multiple root causes, you know, and we are not claiming that it relates to all of them, but it must to relate to at least one of them. And um, in the future, we clearly want to understand the mechanistic details, what enzymes drive these age-related changes. On the simplest level, we know, of course, that methylation marks are um, involve DNA methyltransferase enzymes who deposit marks or maintain these methylation marks. But there must be other enzymes that control these aging effects. Actually, it's quite a debate, you know. Some people think that what we're measuring is simply the results of entropy, you know, age-related decline and increase in variability of methylation. Other people think there is a meaningful biological process underlying these changes. In my original paper from 2013, I proposed a so-called epigenomic maintenance system that could govern these changes. But there are many other plausible explanations for these age-related changes. It could be that most CPGs change with age due to really epigenetic drift entropy, but there is maybe a subset that really reflects a biologically important pathway that might play an, also a role in development because the epigenetic clock really applies to the entire life, applies to DNA samples from children and even prenatal samples. So we have strong evidence that it also relates to a process that plays a role in human development and in cell differentiation. And in certain ways, the epigenetic clock suggests that aging is just a continued, unarrested process of development. And so we feel there could be an important biological process. But this will really be the subject of future papers from our group or from others. It's a very active research area. But our paper showed 
once and for all that it's actually very much worthwhile to study that topic, meaning methylation changes in aging, because as I said, they must relate to a root cause of aging. Yeah, and to add to that, I think that on top of the understanding the biology from a population level, all cause mortality, which is the endpoint that we looked at, is still a very crude measure. I think it's important to also understand what clinical or aging phenotypes are associated with DNA methylation age. That's right. So, for example, one of the big killers is heart disease, right? And in a previous publication, we looked at whether methylation age predicts incident or future coronary heart disease in the Women's Health Initiative. And these studies were a disappointment. We just didn't find that it predicts heart disease. You know? So it could be that we got unlucky and just had a bad data set. But uh, more generally, it would be important to now tease out where does our signal come from? So what kinds of causes of death relate strongly to methylation age and which do not? And also to remember the methylation age of blood is only weakly correlated with the methylation age of other tissues and organs. For example, it would... So it's weakly correlated after controlling for chronologic age. So, so in other words, imagine you have a birth cohort where every single person is exactly 50 years old and you measure the methylation ages of all their organs, lung, kidney, heart, and blood, brain, and so on. You would find that the methylation ages in blood would have only a relatively weak correlation with the methylation age of other um, organs, for example, brain. And the, why? Because all of these people are age-matched. And in my opinion, these deviations between methylation age and chronologic age reflect various stress factors or genetic susceptibilities of certain organs. So it could be whatever causes your brain to age faster than it should is very different from what causes your blood to age faster than it should. You know? so, so these effects are quite organ specific. And so, for example, if the methylation age of blood is not very predictive of heart disease, that in certain ways makes sense, you know, but one would think that the methylation age of the heart muscle or let's say carotid arteries or other relevant tissues would be predictive of future risk for heart disease. Yeah, I think that's all from us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um.